Okay, I'm rolling. I'm rolling. The reason why I started fear in the nervous system he was sitting at home and my dad was in a really bad health situation. He was dying. Fieldy was at home, I think, with his kids. Jonathan had gone on a tour with JDSFA at the time, and I was looking for an outlet to really put all this energy into. One of the things that really inspired me also was Wes Borland put out a record, Blacklight Burns record, called Cruel Melody. And that really inspired me. I remember coming off the road. I was anxious to get back home, but at the same time, what was at home was my father. It was really hard, so I immediately wanted to get back to work. That was really the motivation. Look for an escape, and I wanted to escape back into music. In late 2007 is when I started recording the material, and I wanted to try to take a different route from Korn. When I play Korn songs, it's an extension of who I am, and I really wanted to extend that boundary into a different musical area. So I had to do a lot of different things. I wanted to use all vintage guitars, I wanted to use vintage amps, change the tunings. I did a lot of the songs in standard tuning. A lot of people say it sounds like Korn. I don't hear it. But, you know, maybe it's because I'm playing. I'm very proud of Korn and what we've accomplished. And, you know, starting this new band and trying to get it off the ground, it has given me a chance to reflect how far Korn has come. It makes me really grateful, all the accomplishments that Korn has achieved and will achieve, because there's more to come for Korn. And there's also a lot to achieve with this new band, so each musician that I kind of handpicked was Zach Baird has been touring with Korn for like six or seven years now. Him and I share a lot of similar musical tastes. So there was already a relationship there. One of the first ideas we came up with was on the bus. It's an instrumental song called Silvertone. All these things are coming together over courses of tours. We're actually in the middle of another Korn tour and I'm sitting back here in the back of the bus just messing around with some new plugins I've got. For some reason, right now, this piece is saying organ to me. And then Brooks Wackerman, we actually used him to track on the Untitled album. I remember Atticus Ross, because he produced that record, telling me, that room and that drummer is fucking unbelievable. And that's coming from somebody who I highly respect as a producer. After he said that, that always stuck in my mind. So as soon as I had the opportunity, had the conception of fear in the nervous system, that was sort of like, Okay, we're going to get Brooks, we're going to do it in that room, we're going to use that drum set, which is actually Jonathan's drum set, it's a Brady kit. You're fired! What happened? You didn't play the snare like I wanted you to. Something like this. You're rehired. Leo Ross is Atticus's brother. We worked on See You on the Other Side in Untitled. He was really involved with the editing 
of those two albums. He has a very musical background and he's just smart when it comes to coming up with the right hooks, getting the right sounds. He knows exactly what he wants to hear. He loves being in the studio. It actually wasn't until later in the project when we approached Billy Gould from Faith No More. Everybody knows I'm a huge Faith No More fan. It just so happens that our guitar tech, Jim Otell, used to work with Faith No More, so he knows Billy. He agreed to come, and I remember I picked him up from the airport, and he had his bass, which I was surprised and excited at the same time. Once we got to the studio, we you know hung out for a little bit, and he liked some of the stuff. He had even brought some of his own tracks that he was working on. We turned into songs later, which is called The Combine. I knew that if we could record a bunch of drums, we could later piece them together and sort of make songs. I was kind of trying to conduct him and hit this snare and hit this cymbal, and I had a lot of fun doing it because it was my session. I was, you know, producing it. It was very different than how we write with corn because it was, it was so unstructured and just kind of like we didn't really know what we were going to do from day to day. That was liberating, just having no sort of bounds. We actually brought in some timpani drums that we rented, and that's what you hear in the, the first song, the intro, which is called Hell. And we had a percussion jam with everybody in the studio. Everybody picked up a tambourine or a shaker. And I'm a huge Mike Patton fan, so Mike Patton had put out a band called Peeping Tom. I started to research where this name came from, and actually it was a, an old movie about this guy who likes to kill hookers and film it at the same time. In the movie, there's a series of books on this killer on his bookshelf called Fear in the Nervous System and it is a documentation of books that his father wrote about him. He was interested in the reactions of the nervous system to to fear. Fear? Fear. What happens to your nervous system when you introduce fear into it? It changes basically the molecular structure of how a person thinks and who they become. The guy's father scared him so bad he became a, a serial killer. I thought the whole thing was so interesting. It originally was going to be just the nervous system, but I decided to go with fear in the nervous system. I think it tells more about what the band represents. Initially, I was going to sing on this thing. I was struggling with the fact that, you know, I'm not a singer, and I wasn't satisfied, I guess, with just being a guitar player at that point. I wanted to get out there and be the front man, but then I was struggling with the pressures of that lyrics. I hesitated to do it for so long, but it wasn't until we started to record the album Remember Who You Are with Ross Robinson. That is when 
he started listening to the instrumentals of all these songs and he's like we got to find a singer if you're not going to do it we should find a singer these songs are too good you got to do it for your dad okay who do you got he's like i got it and jumped up out of his seat and played me a couple of things from repeater i could hear his voice and it possibly working over these fear in the nervous system tracks steve showed up at our studio he, we sat in this control room and listened to two or three songs he'd only heard it a couple times ross is like you got to get in there and start singing right now <laughs> steve was immediately shaken by the whole idea but when he got in the vocal booth and started like humming some of these melody ideas they weren't just like melody ideas they were like actually emotions it and hear it on some of these videos it's someone opening up and I was thinking how intense it was and he didn't even have words yet and we were all blown away I remember everybody had goosebumps and chills yes this guy he's the shit he's awesome you can hear some of the ideas that he came up with ended up being some of the vocal melodies that we actually used on the final takes the way it all came together was just effortless. La 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 la. <laughs> awesome dude, you wow. want to do it again? No. <laughs> I said no. <laughs> The song is about hell? They're, they're all about hell. Right away when I met Steve, we had a lot of the similar ideas as far as coming up lyrically. We share a lot of movie-inspired content. I told him some of my favorite movies, and one of them was From Hell, which is the story about Jack the Ripper. One of them he wrote about one of his favorite movies, which is In the Line of Fire. Another was about the Peeping Tom movie, and he took a lot of these ideas and watched some of the films and kind of came up with his own movies or in own interpretations of these films and was able to kind of get inside my head. Ross is going to come in there and stare at you while you sing. Oh, crap. Steve was so generous about working so hard on the record. He really wanted to make us all proud. It was very different for him to switch genres of music so quickly. What did you feel that day? Why are you still alive? Who? Uh. Whoa. Can I listen to that? I wanted to give him something. <laughs> I know, so you really, expect uh, me to know what to say? We're really happy with what you've been doing. I'm extremely touched. Well, it looks good on you. It's totally your style. It was really exciting for him. He couldn't believe it. I remember he was shaking. and I don't think he's, he believed it until he actually left the studio with it. <laughs> ah, thanks. <laughs> The artwork for the album was done by Wes Borland. Just his outlook on art and music, it's so unique and different. He's always been really in inspirational to me. We've known each other through the years because of Blimp Biscuit and Corn, and I wanted him to be part of it in some way because without his inspiration, I wouldn't have been able to do the project. He came in the studio and for a couple of days and 
We did record a couple of songs. We had so much material at the time. We didn't have enough time to really flesh out the ideas. Maybe one day we can take those songs and go back and re-record that stuff. I just asked him, will you paint the album cover? And he said, yeah, um, what are you thinking? And he had this really cool medical book from the 20s. We went through this and we found one picture that was a cross-section of a human body. And then he did another painting that him and I liked, a cross-section of an ear. That's also on the inside cover of the album. That represents listening to the record. But the actual painting of the album is five feet by six feet. It's huge. Choking victim. Musically, it was, it just felt different from anything I've ever done because, you know, right in the beginning, it's just odd time and it's just like this building, something's about to happen, like earth shaking, sort of shattering guitars. And I wanted to sound like the, you know, the world is gonna end. Timid and trust and soul. Is it just my own? Burned through skins of rejection, one exit. From this fireside prison of pale judgment, cruel injection. Choking, victim, choking, victim. music video, the director Yarvo, my wife introduced me to him. He has a tendency in his videos to really take things to the edge and be very dark. And I liked what I saw in his reel. It's a lot like how the band got the name, honestly. It's about a kid who witnesses abuse and then later becomes a murderer or a serial killer. It's been a long road to get to this point. I'm grateful that the record's finally out and people can hear it. My girlfriend and I put this package together. It's quite a treat to see it finished. If you draw little glasses on that, it'll yeah. be you. In stores now. What's next for Fear in the Nervous System? We are putting some shows together and some rehearsals. It's gonna be crazy. I think we're probably doing this one. That's the B-side from Japan. And probably this one. Oh, this is gonna be so fun. We've got lots to choose from. This is the smallest pedal board for me right here. Wow. In a long time. I downsize, bro, in this economy. I can't run that much electricity. Oh, okay. Meet Rami's gonna pull the plug on me, fucking pedal board, bro. <laughs> There's just been so much anticipation to get all these songs and perform them live, and I kind of really want people to see how talented Steve Krolikowski is. He's a star to me. That guy is just so super talented. Everybody's schedule is so kind of all over the place. I knew it was going to come to a point where I was going to have to replace one guy. So I asked for some help from our friend Mark Phillips. 
He helped me find some musicians. Elias Mallon, who plays for Opiate for the Masses and Kill Hannah, he was able to jump right in. He's nailing it. And he recommended his friend, Tim Keller, who's the touring bass player for 30 Seconds to Mars. Not many people play with a pick, really aggressive, like punk rock style like that. I couldn't have wished for a better band. We have four shows we're gonna begin with in California. And one of them's in Redondo Beach, one of them's in Agora Hills, one of them's in Bakersfield, and one of them's at the Roxy in LA. So that's sort of the beginning of this. Hopefully we'll get some festival dates early in 2013. Start booking a few shows here and there just to build up some momentum. Hopefully we're gonna follow this up soon with the, another record while the momentum's built and this also can give people a little bit of insight as to how much fun we had but not only the hard work everybody put into this one record it pays off it's really in memory of my father and that's what the whole project is really about <laughs>